Okay. Um, so as we've experienced uh, SPs and users alike over the last few weeks, um, we have seen quite a bit of chain activity increase since FVM um, and, and quite a lot of chain bloat, uh, which has made things difficult, uh, especially for SPs in terms of block rewards and, and really just keeping sync over the last few weeks. Um, it's obviously awesome that we now have FVM. It's an historic achievement for Filecoin, um, but the next work landscape is changing um, and it is, does mean that the SPs and other users alike uh, developers etc are going to need to adapt and leverage every tool at their disposal um, and this is where IPC interplanetary consensus comes in um, I'm going to post a link to the IPC website the our consensus lab YouTube channel in the zoom chat so if you like to browse as you're listening you certainly can do um, and we have a couple of, of questions um, which uh, have been pre-submitted um, and we have many members of the Consensus Lab team here now. Um, so um, let's kick this off. And the first question um, I'm going to put to the team is, does the FEM tooling work for subnets, IPC subnets too? Matej, you want to take that one? Uh, yes. So uh, can you just repeat the question again so I didn't forget properly? Sure. That's the so IPC. Does in terms of IPC and IPC subnets, um, is it compatible with FEM tooling? Uh, ideally, uh, ideally, Alfonso would answer that. I'm here mostly for the consensus part of it. Uh, so I would like to delegate this question to somebody who is, who knows it better because I don't want to say something that is actually not right. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I well, Alfonso is isn't here yet, so uh, let me just give you my, <laughs> my high level thought. So in, in principle, yes, I mean, so so uh, we, other than the consensus algorithm, right? We we run the 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 same FDM. Uh, we have support for everything. You, you should be able to do exactly the same things that that you are able to do on hyperspace or or on mainnet. Uh, in practice, I'm sure that there will be gotchas uh, around this, right? In particular, uh, you you do need to if you're using, well, actually this came up this morning, right? If you're using MetaMask, for instance, right? You need to connect to a particular network, a particular chain, right? And you need to configure the endpoints and the chain ID. And of course we, uh, like this might be very subnet dependent. So so there is a there is a, a UX concern around this in terms of, of how, uh, how these things will be made easy for, for the user, which right now they wouldn't be, right? But But in principle it is, uh, the interface is compatible, right? So, so you should be able to use any tool with more or less configuration necessary. Thank you very much, George. Moving on to the second pre-ask question, I will be opening up, opening up to everybody soon. Um, when will IPC be available on mainnet? Alfonso has just arrived. I asked the wrong question first, didn't I? <laughs> uh, so, well, I, 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 I can try to take that one too. But uh, so, 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 we have a public roadmap, right? I mean, you, you, uh, full disclosure. It's uh, so it's on our website, ipc.space, uh, and you do see two milestones there, uh, including a, a first one in in Q two at the end of Q two. Uh, for having uh, something uh, deployed on, on on mainnet, and by something I mean uh, you know something that works that you can use, but that will be very rough and have limited tooling around it. And then in Q3, we we would have the the production deployments uh, there. And, and this is the full disclosure part. That's that's uh, exactly what it says on the website. There have been uh, some some changes both internally because because we uh, we will have to look into some root net consensus topics as well and also uh, because of the of the uh, fem timeline and so we we may we may change some of these dates we hope to have an answer uh, next week i i don't want to make a hard promise here but but yeah but if if we make any updates to the roadmap we do hope to make them uh, next week already but it, it will, the timeline is definitely, uh, you know, uh, this year. Uh, the question is what will be, what will be available in, in Q2 or Q3, right? And so that, that level of detail will, will 
have to recommunicate and update the website at a later point. But but of course, I mean, in the meantime, you you can you can start experimenting with SpaceNet. So obviously, do not use it for anything that's uh, you know uh, production <laughs> that has production requirements. And uh, obviously, it's not using real fuel; it's using test fuel. Uh, so, but in in order to to you know develop applications or 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 test them on on IPC, that that should uh, work today. Thank you very much, George. I'm gonna um, direct one in Alfonso's direction, if that's okay. Um, what is the block the block time uh, uh, based on IPC um, and track uh, TPS? Um, what is it now? Is it likely to change? What are your what are your views on block times and TPS? Okay, I will take this one and then throw the ball to Matei afterwards. So uh, currently in SpaceNet, uh, we so trying to mirror the consistent algorithm that we currently use, it allows up to one second block times. So we can go really fast. But in order to make the kind of user experience that someone will have once IPC is is uh, bundled, like it's anchored to, to Falcon mainnet, we decided to leave it in 15 second block times. So SpaceNet currently has 15 second block times. In its first release, it was one second block times, but we decided to, to um, slow it a bit so that uh, we had the same kind of user experience that we, will, we should expect when we go to Falcon mainnet. It's not exactly the same, but like closest to what it's uh, Falcon mainnet. And then for subnets, this is configurable which means that it's up to the, we don't expose really easily right now the, the parameter, but we could expose it and allow anyone to, to choose for their subnet, whatever block times they want, because this is something that we can adjust in, in mere, mere transform. And then I said I was throwing the ball to Matei because I want him to answer the transaction per second one. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, also full disclosure, there uh, we only did a very preliminary measurement so far, and uh, as far as I in our test deployment, it was between one and two thousand. But this is definitely planned to go up through various optimizations that we already have in mind. We just didn't have time to implement them yet. Thank you very much, chap. Um, moving on to to. Um the business side of things. Um, is there a, a business model for subnet validation? Um, and connected to that, can I use custom tokens on SpaceNet on subnets? Um, and can fees be priced in custom tokens? Okay, I will start this one and maybe just throw the ball again <laughs> to probably to church this time. So uh, I will talk about the technical side. Uh, right now, what we have and subnets operate in the same way that uh, a Falcon network would operate, which means that the native token is Falcon and the gas is paid in Falcon. That being said, um, the plan is that in subnets, you will be able to, to configure the rewards. So how you move around the, like, how you reward validators in your subnet with this native token will be configurable. It's not as straightforward. So this is already possible today. It's not as straightforward to have a, a custom token, let's say, because you would have to implement some way of, of pegging the native token of IPC, which is Falcon, to your to your custom token for rewards. This is something that in design we have like sketched out, but in implementation it may take a while. I mean, if there's future requests for this. We can prioritize it. Right now, we are not prioritizing it. But that being said, like subnets ship with the FEVM, it has complete support to deploy your own ERC20s. You can implement an exchange that does the the, the swapping between your custom subnet address and um, and the native token. But this would be more of a do it yourself than something out of the box. If we get the feature. Um, like a lot of users <laughs> need these rewards in, in custom tokens and so on, we could make it out of the box. In, so it was in the initial design, but we decided to deprioritize it for, for implementation. And regarding the business model behind validation, I think it's subnet specific, but I don't know George or anyone else <laughs> in the FEC team if they want to add something. I mean, I can say something, but please uh, folks, if, if you have different thoughts, I. I... 
so it, it is subnet specific, right? In the sense that one goal is to really keep this flexible, and we're not necessarily we're not really enforcing uh, anything on, on the subnet operators or or creators or, or or users. And so the I would say that you know uh, our goal is to, is to provide uh, one or more uh, useful or generally useful uh, crypto economic models for, for subnets. Uh, those are, haven't been developed yet. And if you have feedback that that's very useful, but you know, uh, at, the, at the most basic level, you, you can have a subnet that just relies on, on transaction fees. And so validators just get rewarded based on, on fees paid. There's, no, there's not necessarily a fee burning in, in, in subnets, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's part of the, of the model that gets implemented. So, so you, you can just do it based on fees. You can, uh, as, as Alfonso mentioned, uh, mint your own tokens. Uh, that part will probably carry a little bit more complexity, but by the time we go to, to mainnet, uh, hopefully we'll, we'll have templates for, for that as well. And then it really depends on the nature of the subnet, right? Because if it is, if it is a private subnet for, for a specific application, maybe uh, you, you don't need incentives or maybe you do need to pay validators, but but you can do that, uh, let's say, off chain through through business agreements. It, it really depends on 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 what you're trying to to deploy. But our goal is really to keep things as flexible as possible and accommodate the, the as wide the diversity of models as as possible. Awesome, thank you. Um, so we had a bit of information. Let's kick it open to the to the participants. Does anybody have any feedback or questions they would like to ask at this point? Thank you, Fem. And we have one in chat. What are some of the merits IPC offer for, for decentralized apps, particularly besides higher trans, uh, transactions per second? Any example use case in mind? So the most straightforward one that I can see in the Python ecosystem is the fact that some use cases may not fit the current consensus algorithm of Python, at least in the short term because Filecoin has, uh, it doesn't have instant finality. Subnets, as they run a PFT, they have instant finality. So apart from performance, like there's a, a lot of things that, I mean, going faster will allow you to do other kind of use cases. For instance, I'm thinking about bridges that don't need that amount of, of like finality to see that that as swap is possible and, and these kind of things. It would also allow to decouple a lot of like storage markets and, and storage related um, application could move to a subnet potentially and uh, be geographically um, located. And then finally, that being said, we're trying to make this as configurable as possible to the extent where plugging in uh, your own consensus algorithm should be possible or no consensus algorithm at, at all should be possible. So you can play with the trade-off of security with performance. Um, I cannot think of a, I mean, I can think of a few use cases that like may be dumb, but when you want to do serverless or decentralized serverless to some extent where you have more than one participant operating the infrastructure instead of having a central participant in the cloud, um, like handling all of that operation, you could think of a permissioned um, subnet that still keeps the interoperability with Falcon and like the, the ability of interaction with storage that lives in the Falcon network. That's kind of the reasoning behind all of this, like to have a framework that allows you to fine tune the infrastructure and the substrate to your use case. But we are eager for use cases and people testing this to double check that our assumptions are correct. So everyone more than welcome. Thanks, Sokon. So while you're unmuted, can I also ask what security guarantees subnets provide? Who would like to jump on? Okay, I can I can tell the high level uh, view of it. So the security guarantees of a subnet uh, are basically again subnet specific. So whatever deployment of a subnet you have, uh, you get the corresponding security guarantees. And uh, the one, one crucial aspect of uh, IPC is that we enforce the so-called firewall property on the subnet is that uh, whatever funds you uh, lock in a in a parent network that is used in the in the subnet you will never lose even if whatever goes wrong in the subnet you never lose more than what you insert in the subnet thank you very much and, and please, please others complete this 
if there's more to say. Well, this, uh, just to add up to that, there is periodic checkpointing at the parent that allows to anchor uh, periodically the security to the parent. So uh, even, even if some things can go wrong in the child subnet, once a uh, previous state is checkpointed at the parent, uh, this, it, this is, a, is the scope of how, how much can go wrong is kind of limited if the parent doesn't, doesn't uh, break as well. Thank you. Any, any questions uh, from the attendees? And as Fatman did, please feel also free to, to type them out in, in the uh, Zoom chat if you prefer. Otherwise, we can move on to uh, another pre requested question. Awesome. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to be um, just focusing on, on SPs. I'm an SP. We have a couple of SPs here. Um, but will can subnets interact with storage, so with things like deals, et cetera? So in the current state, the way in which, I mean, storage will still live in the root net, uh, in the market actor, storage actor, and so on. And um, the miners will still, the minor actors will still live in the root. What we can do is that subnet smart contracts would be able to interact with these actors through um, cross-net primitives. So we have uh, the ability, smart contracts in a subnet have the ability of sending messages to any other subnet uh, and calling actors in any other subnet uh, in the hierarchy. And you would be able to interact with, store, uh, with the storage in, in this way. So you would have like, if you want to, you have your application that runs in a subnet and you want to onboard new storage to a, a storage deal or any other storage primitive, you would have to interact with the actors at least in the root net, which means that the uh, your subnet actor that for your uh, DAP would have to send crossnet messages up to the root and like trigger all of the flow, the storage flow that your application needs. In the future, like once we start developing this more, we could have like instances of these minor actors, storage actor, all the storage specific uh, smart contracts in subnets, so that you have you would have a way of also like. But but the thing is that it's. It's a bit harder to do that integration, right? Because how do you do the sector bookkeeping and you know like where where is the storage uh, in in the hierarchy and so on? So that's why initially the only support that we will have for storage is subnets being able to interact with storage through uh, cross net primitives to uh, interacting with actors in the root. If this makes sense. Thank you, Alfonso. Um, we had a, a, another question in chat again from Fatman. Can subnets validator collectively decide to revert to a previous <laughs> checkpoint? This is an amazing question, and uh, it is possible practically, but we don't have the means of doing it easily and with the proper UX. Meaning that uh, one of the things that we do is that we anchor the, um, so we anchor actually just a CID of the state of the, of the subnet in the checkpoint. And um, right now we are not doing it, but we could like, uh, persist this snapshot in IPFS or Falcon, which is our plan. So that someone wanting, uh, like looking to, to restart the subnet from a previous state could get this checkpoint and restate from it. Like it's like starting from a snapshot, but like starting from a snapshot that is in IPFS and that's the, check, that's the one that the checkpoint points to. That being said, the UX right now, it's not there. So the flow, it's kind of horrible. <laughs> um, but you could do it manually, even at this stage. Thanks, Alfonso. Um, and by the way, if someone from the team wants to add something, like I'm just, I keep answering the questions, but feel more than free. I'm monitoring faces. Does anybody else want to jump in with any comments? I mean, I mean adding, adding to that, how so, IPC might help SPs in general would also be an interesting question. No, just wanted to complete what Alfonso said from a slightly different point of view that uh, you can you can uh, also I don't know whether it is easier from a user experience point of view this I don't know but you can take a checkpoint and just completely abandon the old subnet and just start a new subnet starting from a different checkpoint whichever you choose as long as someone has the full state available that you can use to sync from yeah like. Yeah, but if the validators collectively decided, then yeah, yeah, some of them. Do if that. the validators collectively decide, that's 
quite straightforward. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and another prayer. What is the consensus protocol running on subnets? So the consensus protocol is currently called Trantor. It is a. Uh, it is still being uh, properly uh, developed. So its first version is running now, implemented in the Mir framework, and uh, it is a modular. It is meant as a modular consensus protocol where uh, you, you have a framework where, where everything is modularized in rather small parts and if it should be easy to swap in to implement and swap in some different protocol when when anybody decides to do that but currently we have this one implementation it's a classic bft style protocol where many leader based uh, bft style protocols are multiplexed together into one total order Awesome, thank you. Let's open it up. We've got a few more joiners that have, uh, that have hopped on. So uh, any questions at all from uh, those in attendance? And we have a, a non-comment from Walter. Thank you. I think, thank you, Walter. Walker. Um, so I listened to a podcast recently where the following concerns were raised about EVM side chains. So let's take this one question at a time. Number one. Sequences are centralized. Solving this problem is hard, and solving this problem ends up making the subnet essentially an L1. So why have L2s in the first place? Okay, so uh, that's a great question. And um, at a high level, that's what we're trying to, uh, so our proposal is that, like trying to decentralize sequencers. And in the end, if you see what others like Seike uh, projects are trying to do, they're thinking about embedding a BFT on top of their sequencers so that they can start decentralizing that process. It's not easy because you need consistency, you need like a lot of bad things. What we do is that we add a blockchain layer, right? We just, our side chain is, a, and a, is a, in itself a blockchain. And what we do is that instead of having a unidirectional uh, roll up, let's say, we have uh, communication in both directions. Like it's, it's stronger the one from the, from the child to the parent because we are actually anchoring and like relying for our security but instead of having like a one-way uh communication we have a two-way communication and we're instead of trying to just uh decentralize the sequencer in a more distributed system-ish way we just like plug in there at blockchain so that you can do stuff there even implement rob and then like have these pipes that allows you to implement whatever case you want yeah, mom. I'm in this really boring meeting. These guys can't shut up. Like, so. Oh, wait. Sorry, I'm unmuted. Oh, my bad. Sorry. We did have this in a call the other day. That's unfortunately the uh, the perils of uh, publishing Zoom addresses. To yeah, mom. This guy's not shutting up. He's so annoying. Like, I don't know. And goodbye. Um, so moving on swiftly to walk a second uh, point, EVM L2s still don't address uh, the fundamental scaling issue, which is the lack of parallelization, oh, I can't say it, parallelization inherent in the EVM. Would anybody like to comment on? Yeah, happy to take over. Uh, feel free to do up on that theme. But um, so the under my understanding is, uh, because we're bringing L2s to user land, uh, different applications will uh, have different state that can be easily parallelizable compared to having CK rollups or having uh, just a sharding approach. And that's the advantage of having subnets. Thank you very much. Let's open up to, to any other questions as well. Who runs subnet validators? In SpaceNet right now, it's only Consensus Lab uh, running um, validators, and hopefully in the future we'll be able to onboard external parties so that we can test like different parties running this consensus. And for subnets, it's up to the subnet. Like when you deploy your subnet, you decide how you're gonna handle the permissioning of your, of your subnet. So right now, 
um, in the current reference implementation, because like the the policies, the policies that govern a subnet are defined in the subnet actor. We have a reference implementation of a subnet actor, but we expect that applications and and developers will de develop and deploy their own their own versions of, of, of this subnet actor. And there you choose how you permission or, or what is the minimum requirements that your validators need to have in order to join a subnet. Right now, the only requirement that we have is a minimum collateral. Once you put that minimum collateral, you can deploy your own validator and start participating as a validator in the subnet. But again, this is just to give a bare bones of the subnet actor. I expect that users will come up with whatever their application needs. Maybe some want to be completely permissionless or kind of permissionless and have this uh, minimum collateral requirement. Others may have latency requirements. We know of, for instance, Saturn, that they're thinking about deploying uh, subnets for geographical areas of, of their providers. And in this case, you like stake alone may not be the best requirement and you may request additional checks for for nodes to become a validator in your subnet. So it's user defined. Um, and yeah, again, like I'm really looking forward to seeing how folks start using this. Thanks, Alfonso. I think you, you spoke to this a little bit earlier, but I just want to ask a question again, because we've had some some new joiners. Um, is there a limit to the number of depth of subnets? So that's a hard one. Um, theoretically, there shouldn't be. Practically, there will be a point like the same way that it's there a limit in the amount of smart contracts or like uh, the load that a uh, blockchain can support. The the answer goes a bit in that direction. So um, in the end, IPC is just a set of smart contracts that are deployed uh, in a blockchain and that receive periodic load from its child. So as long as the parent of uh, these subnets are able to support all of the load that is coming from their child subnet, there shouldn't be um, a limit. That being said, we haven't done an experimental test like the amount. We've gone to a single layer, two layers at most, uh, current layers. So from the root to a first layer of subnets and then a second layer of subnets. We've seen that that works, but we haven't stress tested the, the protocol yet. And, and connected that, what are the, what would the uh, system estimated system requirements to actually run a subnet validator so right now the we just run lotus right we run lotus with a bft consensus so it would um, be equivalent to running and then there's a small process which is the abc agent which is the one that orchestrates like the the, the interaction with the different subnets um, a single validator for a single subnet uh, would be equivalent to running a Lotus full node. And then Josh has something else. Yeah, I, I mean, just two comments on on both the present and the previous question. I mean, uh, so in terms of, of uh, you, as Alfonso said, I mean, we, we tested with two uh, with two no with two levels deep, but this is in principle inductive, right? There is no reason to believe that it would that it wouldn't grow past that but there is a there is a cost right i mean if you are deploying a, a subnet that is super deep that is you know eight levels deep and you want to do a cross subnet transaction that needs to go to the root then of course you need to go through eight layers of checkpointing and that has well it, it in particular it has a time cost but it might also have uh, other costs right so so that that, that is a concern uh, and so I, I think that in most cases unless you have an application specific reason to to nest things very deep like if you're doing some geographic embedding sort of thing and you actually want to have some regions and whatnot uh, I, I think in most cases you wouldn't want to 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 go that deep uh, because the the other the, the only other thing that would force you to go deep is that if you couldn't find space at a high level because the parent subnets were all super saturated, right? And I think we're providing enough capacity that the, that scenario does not seem uh, likely to, to saturate higher layers uh, in, in any foreseeable future. But to, to the second question, which I just forgot. I'm sorry, what was the second question? I, I'm sure I had something to say there. Um, that was speaking to the the uh, number of uh, or depth of oh subject. the system requirements. Uh, I'll, system yeah, requirements. yeah. So the issue with system requirements, yes, it, it is a Lotus node. There, there is one caveat here, which is 
we have a one second block time, right? <laughs> which means that that if you, which means that the chain uh, grows faster, right? I mean, if you're processing a lot of transactions uh, with with one second blocks, you you may have higher storage uh, or even network requirements, but but you don't have the crazy. Sorry for, for the expression, right? But you don't have the crazy requirements that, that you have with, for instance, storage mining, where you do need a lot of like memory or, or fast uh, NVMe stuff. Like there is nothing like that. This is lightweight BFT consensus. The only concern is really, uh, you know, it, it's, it, it's a chain that can grow very fast because, because it has a lot of capacity. Awesome, thank you. All, all the talking about subnets and the system requirements, I'm gonna post, a link to your quick start that this was a, a, a really comprehensive quick start that uh, George uh, created and um, I run through it myself um, so if you want to try out subnets for yourself please take a look at that link it will guide you through every single step from start to finish um, we're at an end of our, our, our pre-submitted questions so I'm going to open the floor now for now and, and, and uh, until we're out of questions to everybody here does anybody have anything they would like to ask the team There's some questions there's... in the chat already. Oh, yeah. Sorry, what was that? So, so there's one question in the chat yeah. already, whether uh, it would be possible that if mainnet is experiencing congestion with high base and subnet failed to anchor checkpoint on time. Well, I guess technically this is possible, but uh, I do not think uh, that uh, there is like a limit on in time in which you need, in which a subnet needs to, to submit a checkpoint. So yes, if a checkpoint is delayed, then uh, the propagation of crossnet messages might might take longer. But uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't see any other fundamental issues with this. Yeah, that's correct. In the current implementation, what happens is that there's no one time, right? Like uh, we expect checkpoints to be committed in order, which means that if you're, you need, you're in Epoch 100 and you have to submit a checkpoint and it's not getting there, the one for 110 cannot be even constructed because we're building a chain of all of the checkpoints until the one for 100. It's uh, assuming a 10 epoch period, um, it cannot be committed, which means that we're, you're just queuing what are the pending checkpoints to be committed. And as soon as the, the there's a lower load, you will be submitting them. This means what Matei mentioned, like there will be some delay on the propagation of crossnet messages and on the anchoring of your security, if this is the case. But there's also an economic angle to this, right? I mean, checkpoints are infrequent operations and they aggregate a lot of stuff that happens within a subnet, which means that you may be willing to, to pay a higher, uh, higher uh, minor tip in this case to, to, to get things prioritized for inclusion in, in your parent or the mainnet, right? So it's, uh, well, then it really gets into the economics. There's a cost to that, right? But the cost is amortized over all of the activity that that takes place. So it it might just be that you can you can pay for priority over uh, over simple messages that people might not be willing to 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 sponsor with with as much uh, as much gas. Or if you don't, if whatever applications you run on the subnet are just not really. If it's not important for them, then you, you can just keep delaying if it's not a problem at the application level. Thank you very much. And thank you all for your, for your, for your questions as well. L last chance, anything you'd like to, to ask that hasn't already been covered? Okay, well, again, thank you all so much for, for being here. Thank you as well to the team for being here. I'm really excited about IPC uh, and it's really good to see so many else, uh, other excited about it as well. Um, as always, if you if you have any questions, please re reach out to us in Slack and Farpoint Slack and IPC help. Um, although the, the launch has only just been um, in the last few days, our YouTube video is already packed with content um, from the team. So please check that out. Um, there's loads of stuff to, to see there and obviously the IPC space website as well, which summarizes everything and provides links to all the relevant content. So again, thank you to the team. Thank you for everybody here and we shall let you get back to your tape and we will see you soon. Thank you. Bye bye.